Hi everyone, and welcome to the first episode of the Queens of Our Past podcast. I guess I should introduce myself. I'm Kirsten. I'm 21 and an art historian living somewhere in New York City. I have a few focuses, such as the Anglo-Saxons, medieval art, and Renaissance art. Uh, I've loved art history and just history in general since before I could read. When I was little, I would take huge coffee table books on Egyptian or Russian art and just look at the pictures. But I've had an obsession specifically with royalty since I was about nine. I guess I owe my interest to a book series called The Royal Diaries, which is absolutely great and I highly recommend them. Uh, I still have all of the books on my shelf at home, so hit me up. I also have another podcast called Spooky Betches, which covers true crime, cryptids, and unsolved mysteries of every type, and I promise that that was not my first or last shameless plug. So let's start on today's royal lady, Queen Christina of Sweden. Coincidentally, one of the Royal Diaries books is on her, so I have somewhat of a passing knowledge on her, but that was probably 10 or 11 years ago that I read it. So I did have to do research, and I'll always tell you resources that I use and sources. The main source that I used is easily accessible through Google Books, which I very much appreciate, and it's Memoirs of Christina, Queen of Sweden, Volume 1, and I also used a timeline created by somebody on their website, which I'll definitely link, which was actually very helpful because all of my sources I use for some reason, they all put everything in different order of years, which was very frustrating and confusing. (laughs) Once I looked at this timeline, this person had actually put everything in correct order. So I used a few others, which I'll definitely link below and you'll have easy access to them. So let's talk about Christina's parents. Uh, Her father was Gustavus Adolphus II of the Royal House Vasa of Sweden. He had great ambitions, such as freedom of religion, and he wanted to make his country great, just as any king wants to. And he really wanted to father a son, uh, but that would never happen. But he really made the best of that situation, as we'll see. Her mother was Maria Leonora, of Brandenburg. I've seen two different spellings of her name. It's either Maria Eleonora or Maria Leonora. Um, I'm going with the second because that's the one I've seen the most. And all that really is said about her is that she was considered very beautiful. And later on, she had a lot of mental health issues, which we'll definitely cover. So they had two daughters before their third and last child. A stillborn daughter in 1621 and a daughter named Christina, born in 1623, but she died within a year. Upon her third pregnancy in 1626, the astrologers, yes, they still use astrologers, predicted the queen would have a son, and she was thrilled with this. She really took her queenly duty seriously. The astrologers also said that one of three things would happen soon after the birth. First, the baby would die, second, Maria Leonora would die, or Gustavus himself would die, which I have to say the first two are pretty good bets as childbirth was still really dangerous and not really understood for another 200 years. I can do an episode on that, but but just imagine no understanding of hygiene and they didn't believe in just letting it happen naturally, they sometimes use their hands as forceps, which obviously when there's no hygiene, that's an issue. Uh, There were other horrible things that were done, but basically it was very, very, very likely that a mother or child would die in birth or both of them. (laughs) So when the baby came on December 8th, 1626, according to the Gregorian calendar, which the Swedish followed at the time, A baby boy was born at the Trekoner Palace in Stockholm, Sweden, except it wasn't a boy. Soon after, they discovered it was a girl. They had thought she was a boy, for a lot of reasons that are problematic today, and proved just how inept the doctors were at that time. Apparently, she was dark and ugly and cried with a loud, rough voice. 
and this is why they assumed she was a male. I've also heard that she had a growth on her groin, which was mistaken for a penis, but this could easily have been rumors spread later on to tarnish her. Something else that is really important about Christina is that a lot of people said that she was a hermaphrodite, which today we think, oh, maybe she was intersex. That's that's totally cool. That's fine. But back then, that was not considered something positive, and if that were true, that would have never come to light. So they were basically calling her a monster. Whenever it's written in record that she was a hermaphrodite, assume that it's her enemy writing it, or someone who doesn't like her, because they would have never come out and said, oh yes, she has both both working parts to go on. No one wanted to tell the king that they'd made a mistake, but eventually the king's sister, Princess Catherine, took her to the king and told him about his bouncing baby girl. He was actually really excited. He picked her up, kissed her, and said, let us thank God, sister. I hope this girl will be as good as any boy, and this will be an arch girl. She puts tricks upon us soon, which I guess is sweet, but basically he is putting his best foot forward in this situation and saying she'll be great. I'm very happy with her. And you may think, oh, that's weird that he was saying, I hope she'll be as good as any boy, but that's us putting forth the idea that they believed that women were equal, which they weren't, and he was saying, basically, my daughter will be equal to any man. So he was actually giving her a compliment. (laughs) She was christened in the Lutheran church as Christina Augusta a little while after her birth. It was said that the priest was new and reversed the manner in which you make the cross in the forehead, which is, again, probably a rumor because a lot of people would have taken that as a negative. The queen was apparently still under the impression that the baby was a boy and was none too happy that Christina was a she and immediately started hating her because she was ugly. Christina wrote about this in her memoirs and apparently carried a lot of pain and bitterness associated with her mother, which who can blame her? The woman disliked her because she wasn't a certain gender, which doesn't make for good parenting. The queen's ladies would drop her on purpose thinking that it would get rid of Christina and make the queen happy to see the baby suffer, which is fucked up, (laughs) if true. Um, Some people say that that's not true and they wouldn't risk something like that, but she did have a deformity that was caused by an injury when she was a child that broke her collarbone and made one shoulder higher than the other, which she would later hide with the help of fashion but I think that at least she was dropped once, (laughs) and whether it was on purpose or an accident, we can't know that, but Christina says in her memoirs that she was dropped on purpose, so that's either hindsight or her being bitter, who knows. Gustavus had to leave Sweden shortly after she was born, but in 1627, when she was a year old, he returned to Sweden, and officially made Christina his heir. And why he did this isn't really known, but I think it's pretty obvious that she was his only child, and since he was at war all the time, because of the Thirty Years' War, he realized that he might die in one of these battles, and she was his only living child. It would be a good idea to name her his successor to avoid a scramble for the throne by nobles or other countries. Also, All of his brother's children had died and all of his brothers had passed, so there was no one that could rightfully take the throne except for her. He did have- his sister was alive and did have children, but that wouldn't have really been accepted as much because- because it was widely believed back then that bloodline should only go through the male- the male members of a family. So, it seems that Gustavus was a very attentive father, by all accounts. It seems that Gustavus was a very attentive father, by all accounts. When she was two, she became very sick, and he rushed back from touring the country to be with her. And when she was better, he took her with him to show her off, just as he would have done with the son. In 1630, Gustavus went to war again, which broke both their hearts, and they apparently cried in each other's arms before he left. I think it's pretty telling that Gustavus left Christina in the care of his sister, Princess Catherine, who, for a change in history, 
stayed in the land of her birth as she married a noble. Gustavus was obviously the more hands-on parent and primary carer. There's no mention of whether or not the king and queen tried for any more children, but I think he would have been pretty concerned about his wife's actions towards their daughter and probably just thought it was better not to risk it. As I said before, Maria Leonora had obviously taken the queenly occupation of providing a son very seriously, and when it didn't happen, her mental health took a hit. Her hatred for her daughter turned into disinterest and eventual avoidance. I'm going to say that I don't think this means that Maria Leonora was a bad person. Every woman felt pressure to give birth to a son, and sometimes that's still true today. And she'd only had daughters, one of which was stillborn and the other died within a year. She wasn't really giving birth to healthy babies, except for Christina. She probably felt like a failure. She and her husband had been very close until the birth of Christina, and afterwards, Gustavus became absolutely infatuated with their baby, and kind of ignored Maria Leonora after that. I think all of it led to a serious mental illness, which I'm not fit to diagnose. (laughs) So, Gustavus himself appointed a tutor before he left, which is pretty remarkable. Rarely do kings put so much time into their children, and I think it really shows that he was taking on the role as father and mother, as the queen was usually the one in charge of the daughters and younger sons. Now, I don't speak Swedish at all, so I am going to try as hard as possible to correctly pronounce these names, (laughs) because up until now, I think I've been very spoiled (laughs) with these pronunciations. Chancellor Axel Oxensterna was appointed her tutor, and regent should anything happen to Gustavus while he was at war. Later, John Mathai Gothus would be her tutor during her regency, um, and he was a man of the cloth who believed in peace and higher learning. He desperately wanted and believed that Protestantism and Catholicism could reconcile and behave cordially to each other, which later led Christina to be tolerant of Catholics in her kingdom. He taught her the works of Erasmus, Grotius, and Cassander, all of whom were very highly thought of at the time and are still taught today. At one point, he wrote a book so controversial that he was accused of heresy and forced to leave his holy station in the Lutheran church. She was also taught by John Skite, who had her read Machiavelli, which is an absolute must for any person who has to inherit a country. As I mentioned before, the Thirty Years' War was up and running for a good while, and while in Germany, King Gustavus Adolphus II died in the Battle of Lutzen on the 6th of November, 1632. He was only 37 years old, though in his portrait, to me, he looks like a man of 50 or 60. I think the stress of being a king while at war, being a father and mother to his young daughter, and in full knowledge of his wife's fragile mental state, aged him prematurely. He really, really looks old in this picture. And when I learned that he was only 37, I was shocked that he had white hair and just looked so haggard and tired. So Christina was now king of Sweden at the age of four. However, she wouldn't officially be crowned until 1650 when she was 24, nor was she in any way allowed to rule the country until she was 18. I say king of Sweden because a lot of people didn't really know how to address her at the time and sometimes to this day they still call her a king because that's what her father said that she would be that she would be a king not a queen because to him a queen was somebody that just gave birth and did good things for the people not somebody who ruled the country so Sweden was still a pretty backwards place where a lot of peasants still worship the Norse gods And though that's not a bad thing, it is pretty weird that Christianity just seemed to skip them. Um, Nobles couldn't read or write, and doctors practiced alchemy instead of learning about anatomy. So, in the source I use, the way this author describes how these people lived is very biased. At least I think so. Because he said the food was poor, everyone was an alcoholic... Houses were plain and ugly, the rooms painted white and badly furnished. Well, I mean, that's a matter of opinion. (laughs) 
they could have believed that it was very nice and that they liked their white houses and their ugly furniture. Also, carriages weren't used apparently, but very soon after, around 15 years later, Christina was being rolled up in a carriage to the cathedral where she would be crowned. So I guess that was quickly fixed. At any rate, Gustavus's body was brought back to Sweden. And here's where we get a good idea of his queen's mental deterioration. She demanded to keep his heart in a box and said that he wasn't allowed to be buried until she could be buried with him. 18 months later, Chancellor Axel forced her to relent so that they could bury him. In an odd turn of events, Maria Leonora refused for her daughter to be cared for anyone other than herself and barred entry of her sister-in-law to the palace of Traconer. Eventually, the Chancellor had Maria Leonora banished to the castle of Gripsholm, where all visits with her mother were to be supervised, which again was another good decision by the men in Christina's life. In 1638, when Christina was 12, her guardian and beloved aunt died, and there was a scramble to, re- to reorganize her royal household so that there was somewhat of a consistency to her life, which, as backwards as that sounds, it worked. <laughs> Four women were appointed to become pseudo-mothers and heads of the household for the young girl. Their names were Ebba Leonhoffed, Christina Nat Ostag. Um, They were appointed to share the position of royal governess and foster mother with the title castigation mistress, which sounds terrifying, while Beata Oxenserna and Ebba Reining took care of the household while Christina was still a child. Chancellor Axel's goal with this was to ensure that Christina didn't become too attached to any one of them, which actually, as I said before, turned out to be a great plan, and Christina didn't really talk about them in her memoirs. And when she did, it was to say that she was happy she wasn't as feminine and squeamish as they had been. She was described to be a rough and tumble child. Her father had been right. She did not act as her female cousins or her other ladies of the court did, but preferred to study for hours and had a particular knack for languages, of which she spoke at least eight besides Swedish. She was known to let her messy hair do what it wanted and wear men's shoes because they were more convenient and comfortable to wear, which I don't blame her. Christina had a rather large hooked nose, which features prominently in all of her portraits. She slept a little, preferring to stay up late at night reading by candlelight. She was also known for odd combinations of men's and women's clothing, and today we might recognize Christina as gender fluid. You might be thinking, Kirsten, why would you go to that extreme? Well, women wear pants all the time now. Even Catherine the Great would wear officers' uniforms in the 1700s. Well, Catherine the Great of Russia wore men's clothes as a statement of power and equality. She almost exclusively wore women's clothes, unless she needed to prove a point. She usually decked herself almost as lavishly as Marie Antoinette in France did. Christina wore men's clothes seemingly because she was just as comfortable in them as she was in women's. She didn't always want to present herself as female. In many of her portraits, she's depicted as any man would have been, indistinguishable from any portrait of a man. Whatever outfit she was wearing, it was likely they were messy. (laughs) She was known for getting ready in a rush, and things would be unbuttoned or just messy. (laughs) When she was a child, she would start rumors and play tricks on her family members as well as the rest of the court. She was notorious for instigating diplomatic incidents with visiting dignitaries. When she was 18, she was legally allowed to be crowned, but a war with Denmark was still going strong, so she was appointed Queen Regnant until the ceremony could take place. She governed with the help of a privy council led by Chancellor Axel. There's a lot of evidence that that suggests that Christina was almost certainly on the gay spectrum. At the very least, she had a very close relationship with one of her ladies when she was 18, the 15-year-old Ebba Spar. The young queen adored her partner, calling her Belle and bragging to visiting dignitaries of her bedfellow's intelligence and wit. She even married Ebba off to a man that kept her suspiciously close to the court at all times. Even years later, Christina wrote to Ebba about how she would always love her and reminisce about their passion in their early life. And don't we all still hold affection for our first loves? Christina very likely had other lovers, such as Jane Ruthven and Louise Vandernuth. 
though neither of them ever became Christina's favorite as Ebba had. In her later years, she had a few male lovers, such as her cousin Charles Gustave, whom she would name her heir in 1649. And by later, I mean, like, a year later, she had a relationship with Charles, and these were mainly through love letters between them from his time in Germany. After Charles was a man named Magnus de la, de la Gardie, who was a notorious womanizer of the court, and he seems to have never reciprocated her love. He even married one of her close female friends without her permission, Maria Euphrosine, both of whom she sent away from court. She would eventually forgive Magnus and continuously pay off his debts, which he accrued from gambling and excessive spending. So, to get back to a timeline and not just going through her sexuality and gender, in 1645, she aided the creation of the first Swedish newspaper, and in 1646, she began a correspondence with the ph- philosopher Rene Descartes. She eventually asked him to come to Sweden, which he wasn't very keen on, but she lured him in by asking him to organize an academy of science, which would have been the first of its kind in Sweden. He agreed and made his way to the freezing country, and they soon began lessons in philosophy. Turns out they hated each other, and the entire trip was for naught, as Descartes came down with pneumonia and died on his return trip home. (laughs) The academy was never brought to fruition, and the treasury never would have been able to pay off the costs of the institution anyway. It's around this time that Christina begins contemplating the idea of abdicating her throne, something she would gripe with for the next eight years. In 1649, the young queen proved herself even further to be a patroness of the arts and sciences, and she commissioned 35 portraits by Jacob Jordans, for the ceiling of a palace. The next year, 60 paintings, 170 marble, and 100, 100 bronze statues, 33,000 coins and medallions, 600 pieces of crystal, 300 scientific instruments, manuscripts, and books were transported to Stockholm. Christina wanted to bring upon a new era for Sweden, determined to make her country up to date with the latest scientific research and artistic style, the Baroque. She was fascinated by the Islamic world and their advances in science and took the initiative to learn Arabic so that she could study their teachings. She also took an interest in Catholicism, something pretty controversial as the leader of a predominantly Lutheran country. Islam was acceptable. Catholicism was too close to home for the majority of her contemporaries. The Reformation had just ended, not to mention the Catholic Church's counter-Reformation, which was in full swing. They were desperately trying to keep parishioners and bring others back into the fold. Christina spoke with Jesuit priests and missionaries, as well as other Catholic sympathizers who drew her more and more away from Lutheranism, which would become a large issue in the upcoming years. It is said that this interest in Catholicism and its veneration of celibacy is what led her to the decision not to marry from a very early age. I think personally it was probably the book on Elizabeth I of England she read when she was young that had the larger influence on her. She had in front of her proof that a woman could rule without the aid of a husband who would just get in the way. In 1648, Christina was a major linchpin in the Peace of Westphalia, ending the Thirty Years' War which had been going on since the rule of her father. The fact that she publicly came out saying she would never marry that year did not please the courtiers. Already, there was a young woman on the throne who wanted to change many traditions and bring Sweden into the light of contemporary teachings, but she refused to marry as well. Her coronation took place on the 22nd of October, 1650. Her carriage was draped in black velvet with gold embroidery, pulled by three white horses. The procession from the castle of Jacobsthal to the Storeiken Cathedral where she was crowned. She processed from the castle of Jacobstal to the Storken Cathedral, where she was crowned. I don't know if I pronounced that right. I hope I did. The fountains were filled with wine, feasts were provided, and parades followed in the days to come. It had been over two decades that a coronation had occurred, and this was a time for celebration. It was the execution of Arnold Johann Messinius and his son, who was just 17 years old, a year later that called forth the beginning of the end of Christina's popularity. Messinius and his son had written slanderous things and pamphlets on Chancellor Axel and called the queen a Jezebel. They said that she was ruining the country and she was supremely selfish and too occupied with sport to notice the issues in the country. 
it must be recognized that Christina was supremely t- intelligent in a bookish manner, but she knew little about the people she was governing, and they didn't take to her spending well. While she was no Madame Deficit, she spent lavishly on clothes and books and other things that were too that were too posh, I guess I could say, and didn't make her look and didn't make her look as humble as she actually was. In February 1652, at only 25, Christina began complaining of bad eyesight, neck pains, and what we know today as high blood pressure. I think that her years of little sleep and strenuous work were finally catching up to her, on top of her increasing unpopularity. Even though she was remarkably young, her health was becoming very poor very quickly, and this just added to her decision to abdicate. Her physician, Pierre Bordelot, recommended that she take more pleasure in life, get some R&R, soak in warm baths, and generally just take better care of herself, which is remarkably forward-thinking at the time, and I wish I could have the, like, the life that this doctor recommended to her. Just sleeping, taking baths, and, like, eating well sounds wonderful, but I'm a college student, so not gonna happen. (laughs) He didn't believe in bloodletting and believed in exercise and eating well, all of which doctors believe in today, especially the bloodletting part. (laughs) Some people believe that Christina was going through a nervous breakdown, but I'm not so sure. She had been contemplating abdication and she always had that in the back of her mind as plan B or plan A because it was pretty soon that she decided, no, I gotta get out of here. So... I think that she had that in her mind and she didn't really have to worry about it. But, I mean, her mother did have mental issues, like severe, severe mental health issues. And a lot of people said that she was just insane. And she was pretty much locked up in a castle for the rest of her life. So, I mean, she did have that to worry about, but I think it was mostly a physical problem first. And though it's entirely possible, I don't think it was as much of a mental health issue. I think she was literally just becoming exhausted. (laughs) So because of pamphlets that Bordelot shared with Christina, she became an Epicurean, meaning she practiced a philosophy that held simple living and searched for knowledge in the highest esteem. Her mother, who seems to turn up at the oddest of times, and other advisors tried to discourage her from doing this, But that May, she went even further and decided to convert to Catholicism. It was at this time that she decided 100% that she was going to abdicate the throne and move to Rome as soon as possible. In 1653, she ordered at least 6,000 books and manuscripts be sent to Antwerp so that she could meet them and take them with her. Then, in February 1654, she told her cabinet and Chancellor Axel, the man who had been her father since she was four years old, that she was going to abdicate. Axel told her to think on it. He thought that she would regret it a few years later. On June 6th of that year, the abdication ceremony took place, during which she wore her full royal regalia and placed her crown on the head of Charles Gustave, her cousin and former paramour. As soon as possible, meaning literally like the next day, she donned men's clothes and left Sweden, accompanied by a few male companions. They toured Europe, towards Rome, where she planned to convert to Catholicism. So, I hadn't planned on this being two parts, but I think my editor Marley will kill me if it takes any longer. So, I'm going to end this part here, and we'll pick up with Christina's exploits in Europe next time. Thanks, and... Hope you listen to the next one.